Okay, welcome back everyone to a brand new episode of the Crypto Muay Thai podcast. I am super excited to welcome our very special guest today, Do Kwan. He is the founder of Terra Labs. For those of you who have been following the space, um, recently in particular looking at the Cosmos space, you'll know that Terra Labs is kind of shooting the lights out right now in terms of some of the projects um, that they've been working on in 2020, but also some of the ones that are kind of coming of age so far in 2021, like Luna, obviously uh, Mir and getting ready to roll out Anchor. But we'll jump into all that um, down the line right now. Uh, we'll just see how you're doing. Doe, how are you feeling today? Uh, pretty good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure. I really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule um, to sort of illuminate myself, but also the listeners and viewers uh, on what you're building, which you know I really, really find interesting. And we'll sort of touch into that. Before we do, um, just provide you know the general 90-second boilerplate uh, sort of background on yourself um, and sort of how you found your way into this very exciting but also wild world of uh, blockchain and digital assets. Yeah, so I'm an engineer by trading. I studied computer science at Stanford, uh, and uh, for a brief stint in time, I was an NLP engineer at Microsoft before I stumbled upon uh, mesh networking. So I ran a mesh networking startup that developed technologies for user devices like phones and laptops to connect to each other via Wi-Fi so that you can connect to the internet if you don't have direct access. So did that for a while, and in 2000, late 2016, 2017, uh, somebody pulled me into a Facebook chat with uh, different people talking about, uh, you know, Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin, Monero, and things like that. So that's when I got hooked, uh, and uh, you know, started to spend more and more uh, time studying up on the space, on deciding to launch Terra in late 2017. Interesting, interesting. So a very um not similar, but familiar sort of introduction into this space. So with that, launching Terra, what made you want to do that? So 2017, there was a bunch of different things going on. Like kind of in hindsight, looking here in 2021, um, stable coins, like you looking to build, um, well, I guess this might have been before you, you looked at Luna. So what was your initial vision? Whenever you're like, okay, I'm going to start Terra and then, um, you know, look to tackle a problem or address a need that you're kind of seeing in the market at that particular time. Yeah. So, um, like what we saw in the market is a little bit different from what we saw in 2017 and today. So in 2017, I, I think conceptually a lot of the projects that failed were actually pretty brilliant ideas. It's just that uh, when you're trying to you know, create a protocol and stand up a network, it's not really just about how well designed the protocol is. You also need to have distribution. And um, I, I think what most people sort of you know, uh, got confused by when they saw Ethereum for the first time is that they saw Ethereum and thought it would be like the Google Play Store. So I can build an app and I can push it out and make it attractive and a lot of people would use it. But whereas you know, blockchains and uh, Ethereum is a pretty great computation platform, it allows you to uh, do types of things that you couldn't do with a normal computer. It's a pretty terrible, or it used to be a pretty terrible distribution platform. Uh, so I, I think a lot of developers uh, just, you know, uh, spent a lot of time designing the protocols and then issuing tokens, but didn't really figure out the distribution piece. So it sort of all, all fell apart. So what we wanted to do then was uh, we really wanted to, you know, take some of the basic elementary uh, concepts that was coming out in crypto and then to build a product that tens of millions of people could use, uh, you know, to the tune of uh, billions and billions of dollars. And the reason why we felt like cracking the distribution piece of the puzzle was important was because, so for example, if you're going to deal with regulatory skepticism, if you're going to deal with, you know, adoption, getting more players to adopt the currency, you need scale in order to do it and scale in the form of usership and, and in terms of volume. So uh, initially we assembled together something called the Terra Alliance, so which is about 15 e-commerce merchants uh, in East and Southeast Asia, collectively processing about $25 billion in uh, GMB, such that they can you know, take a stable coin, Terra, and then uh, transact with it uh, in order to form, uh, to bootstrap a large network in the beginning. Okay, interesting. So you've got this vision, 
you're sort of building what made you what made you want to choose to go with the cosmos sdk or look at the cosmos blockchain um, from the outset or did you start on ethereum and then eventually migrate over uh to cosmos yeah, so I, I, I don't think it'd be entirely accurate to say that we started on Ethereum, but we spent, uh, we tried to build uh, the protocol on a lot of different blockchains. So we gave uh, Ethereum a shot, uh, EOS was a thing back then. And then, like, even if we never got to the building stage, we, uh, we spent a lot of time doing DD into different types of uh, protocols that we can build on top of. So, um, you know, like the impression is that, you know, for Ethereum, it's, it's, it's great. Obviously it's the market leader and there's a ton of great things and adoption going behind it. But I, I think what a lot of, you know, people on crypto Twitter forget is that uh, what is great depends on application to application. So even in AWS in sort of traditional tech might not be a good fit for lots of different applications. Just so just to say that, oh, there should be sort of one computation platform and it's the right fit for everything. It doesn't really make sense. To, to give a concrete example, if you're trying to, let's say, um, to, let's say, uh, margin trade on your LP tokens on Uniswap, and then your ticket size is, let's say, uh, $2 million, then in that case, Ethereum makes a lot of sense. If you're doing a $2 million transaction, you're willing to wait a couple of minutes before your transaction settles, and you're happy to pay, let's say, $50, $100 in transaction fee. That, that completely makes sense. But if you're trying to build something, let's say, for payments, then it no longer makes sense, right? So for example, uh, you know, I think the, how the gas fees are sort of auctioned in Ethereum is, is a brilliant way of doing spam prevention. But at the same time, it doesn't make sense when somebody's trying to do payments and uh, you know, for some reason the, the transaction fee hikes up to $9 and then you don't know why. And, and then if you ask, the reason is because, oh, you know, like there's some pickle coin that came out and it's spamming the network. That's not a good enough reason to uh, try to convince merchants to use this. So basically, uh, what we decided on is that we needed a blockchain with a sovereign set of rules, uh, whereby we can sort of merge the realities of, you know, uh, pushing out a payment solution uh, to lots of different enterprises, while at the same time maintaining a lot of the censorship, uh, censorship resistance and uh, the the attractive properties of blockchain. So the Cosmos SDK uh, is designed for just that. It allows blockchains uh, to be formed very easily. Uh, taking care of uh, the complicated consensus logic and the uh, key management uh, tools that, that underlie them. And then, um, you know, application developers only need to focus on the core module logic. So it, it, it gave us uh, something that is very similar to the complexity of building uh, smart contracts on Ethereum, while at the same time uh, taking away a lot of the complexities that could be shared by different Cosmos SDK chains. It's kind of a no-brainer. Got you. That that makes total sense. Um, given everything that you sort of just sort of outlined from a business or even from a product perspective, as to like the specific niche that you guys were looking to tackle. So, with that being said, walk me through like what were the early days like? Um, you know, looking to build uh, Luna on on Cosmos. Were there unforeseen sort of missteps? Because for, for those that might not know that are listening or, or watching, um, you know, Luna was was fairly steady eddy uh, in terms of market cap, at least for you know, since 2019, 2020, as long as I've been tracking it. And, and then sort of really took off and had a coming of age um, over the past three, four or five months, um, so to speak, or maybe even a, a little bit before that. So walk us through the early days and then also how you've kind of got to that point where the market recognized that you were building something that was not only technologically sound for the use case that you're going after, but also, um, you know, substantial uh, as well. Yeah, so, so I, I think in some sense, crypto investing has matured a lot. So uh, for example, in 2017, most of the people that were buying coins uh, didn't really ever use them. Uh, and there wasn't really a way to use them, so it didn't really make sense. But, uh, you know, fast forward to today, you know, quite honestly, I think most people that buy coins today don't actually use them, but they get excited by the coins that they can use uh, should they choose to try it. 
So uh, at Terra, so we run, uh, you know, uh, payments companies, we run mirror protocol, but throughout, let's say 2018, 2019, uh, the only application that was built on top of Terra was an e-wallet called Chai, uh, which is sort of like our main conduit to connect to different e-commerce merchants in Korea. So uh, we, we really focused on sort of abstracting away the details of blockchain in that application. So we wanted to make sure that even if you don't know how to manage your own keys, uh, even if you don't understand how fiat on-ramps work, we could sort of take care of that all that seamlessly without the token having to be exposed to the end user uh, should he not understand. So basically it came to a situation where, you know, most of the people that are uh, trading crypto uh, didn't really get to uh, use, uh, you know, the, the application because it was only one geography. And even if they did, uh, you know, uh, it wasn't as tangible because you, you don't need to hold Luna to use the Chai, Chai, token, uh, Chai, Chai application, for instance. So I, I think the market has definitely matured in the sense that it's starting to value, uh, you know, utility assets uh, and then sort of, you know, Luna as a capital asset in the sense that it grows, it grows in value with Terra stable points get more and more transacted. So um, that was uh, kind of interesting. I think the recent price action largely comes from, let's say, uh, you know, a few things. There's a few fundraisers that we've done that are quite exciting, but really because of the launch of Mirror Protocol, uh, which has had sort of, shall we say, really strong early metrics over the last six weeks. Got you. So walk me through um, some of the, the token economics that you're kind of referring to. So the value of Luna seems to be tied to the amount of transactions that actually go through the network. So just, just walk me through that a little bit more. Let's just double click on that quickly and then we can uh, sort of jump to Mir as well. Sure. So uh, if you look at Ethereum, it's more of a type of gas. So uh, Ethereum finds value, well, largely the, the main way is that you need to buy Ethereum to be able to pay for fees for transactions in the Ethereum network. And then like the secondary use case is that Ethereum can be used as a reserve asset, but I actually think that Ethereum being used as a reserve asset is one of those things that's constraining its value, not adding to it. Because, you know, uh, when, you, when you sort of margin call collateral, it leads to massive uh, price dumps. So I think that sort of risk is priced in uh, when, when people are thinking about Ethereum. But in any case, so Luna is a little bit different because every time that a Terra transaction occurs, either in payments or let's say mirror synthetic trading, or let's say a user making a deposit to Anchor, a small percentage of the transaction is paid as a fee uh, to people that are staking Luna in Terra's uh, delegated proof of stake blockchain. So which means that as more and more transactions happen on the Terra blockchain, cash flows to Luna increase. So um, what, what's even more interesting is that Luna is a non-inflationary asset. So if you look at most proof of stake blockchains, they sort of print more of the staking token every block in order to make sure that people that are staking the asset have an incentive to do so. Luna's staking rewards are 100% funded by uh, you know, transaction fees that are paying, being paid in the network. And there's no additional uh, minting of Luna that happens. So in, in essence, you can sort of think about uh, Luna as sort of like an equity token in the sort of the universe of things that are going on in Terra with an ever diminishing supply and 100% propensity to the dividend. I, you're talking my language now. I, I'm, doing the, I'm doing the numbers right there, you caught me. Um, you're, you're talking my language right now. I really, I really, really like that design. So tell me who are, who are your primary users? Do you guys have any, like, I know you said you, you started initially with building um, use case for retailers uh, that were based in Korea. Are they some of the main people that are transacting on the network right now, or, or has it grown and expanded to different types of, um, you know, retail individuals or, or whatnot, may have you? Yeah, so, um, so there's about three companies in sort of the Terra umbrella uh, that interact with uh, our payment apps. So there's Chai, which is an e-wallet that we created in Korea 20 months ago. So this company is doing about $1.5 billion on an annualized basis in retail transaction volume. So it's mainly users that are buying things like, you know, toilet paper uh, or let's say uh, coffee in general purpose e-commerce stores. There's hospitality. Uh, so it spans about, you know, 50, 60 of the largest merchants in the country and use cases, you know, run the gamut from uh, the largest convenience store movie theaters to uh, general purpose e-commerce. 
um, you know, there's about 2.5 million users that have uh, that that are actively purchasing uh, on this application. So um, that's putting things in context. That's roughly you know five percent of the population, four or five percent. So um, it's one of the fastest growing fintech uh, applications in the country, and um, you know it's it's doing pretty well. We also have a smaller uh, e-commerce wallet in Mongolia called MimiPay. So the monthly active usership in this application is about 30 to 40,000 uh, MAU. But what's unique about our Mongolian payment operation is that we have a non-banking financial institution license, which is in US single, roughly similar to a savings bank, which means that we can sort of extend into different verticals besides payments like DeFi, lending, and things like that uh, to be sort of like a testing bed to uh, you know, get these things into more developed markets once we're more ready. Fascinating. I really, really love this. And like, I knew about a decent bit of this um, beforehand, which is obviously one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the podcast to talk, but like kind of digging a little bit deeper. Um, now, I now as you said, the sophistication of investors or users or whatever have you like in the space, now you can see where that sort of like hockey stick, like if you just look straight at the price action, you kind of see it and it makes sense with everything that you're talking about. So not just from a demand perspective, but also from a supply perspective as well in terms of token economics. I actually really, really like that. So you're in Mongolia right now. Are there any other plans to expand? So Korea is your beachhead. It seems like you're you're dominating there. You said one of the fastest growing based upon the metrics that you're sort of talking about. Mongolia, you mentioned. Are there other um, you know plans to expand around Asia or even further abroad? Yeah. So right now we're looking closely at uh, Taiwan and Thailand. Um, so a lot of these expansions should have happened in 2020, but license acquisition has become very difficult uh, due to COVID. Uh, most regulators aren't willing to entertain such discussions at the moment but uh you know in 2021 i think you can expect uh, our payments operation to expand into more geographies awesome yeah I, thailand was the the one that i was thinking right off the top of my head based upon um everything that you sort of talked about it seemed like that would be a perfect fit uh for that particular uh geographic truly fascinating so with that being said I'm sure there'll be other stuff that will that will come up and we can you know sort of bounce back and forth but before we kind of dug a little deeper into into luna you mentioned mir so for those that may not know uh what mir is just provide a little bit of background and then we can just sort of walk forward um you know the metrics that you're talking about and and everything from there just sort of dive a little bit deeper sure so uh mirror is Pretty simple, actually. So uh, if our payments operations allow Terra stablecoins to be uh, very easy to spend, uh, Mirror allows these stablecoins to be uh, very, use, uh, very easily used to invest in every asset class in the world. So Mirror is a synthetics protocol that mints tokens that track the price of basically anything. So it can be commodities, it can be real estate, but initially we thought that it would be interesting if we could have mirrored synthetics that track the price of US equities. Okay, so what are the initial ones that, um, I'm assuming, well, the protocol is, so the exchange is live, correct? Right. What are the, what are the main equity um, stocks or indices that you guys are tracking right now? Yeah, so there's Apple, uh, Tesla, Microsoft, Google, Twitter, uh, there's Vixie, the volatility index. Uh, there's SLV. Uh, uh, there's um, IAU. Uh, so, so some of the commodities ETF tokens. Yeah, so silver and mostly, gold. Right? Yeah, mostly very large tech stocks. Okay, that, that makes sense. So what are some of, let's, let's take a step back. What are some of the technical considerations that you guys need to do to stand up something like that? So... I have a familiarity with what you're talking about in terms of synthetic. So like boil it down to, you know, simple talking about, you know, synthetics and then some of the technical things that you need to implement so that you can ensure that this synthetic asset is in fact mirroring um, the price in on a, on a real time basis of these real world assets that might be being traded on the NASDAQ or NYSC or, or wherever have you. Sure. This, the system is very similar to MakerDAO. So if you look at the MakerDAO construct, you look up, uh, so uh, 
so, so somebody who's looking to mint a stable coin locks up $150 worth of ETH as collateral, or let's say $125 worth of USDC as collateral, and then you mint uh, a stable synthetic, which is the DAI stable coin. So whenever the price of Ether fluctuates, there's a margin call. So i.e. the system reclaims the collateral to sell that off in the market to make sure that they have enough money to defend, uh, you know, to buy back the, uh, the, the DAI token if they need to. So the difference here is if Maker has volatile collateral, which is ETH, and a stable synthetic DAI, Mirror is exactly the same, except it has a stable collateral, which is the Terra USD stablecoin, and then several different volatile synthetics. So let's say tokens tracking the price of Apple stock, Google stock, and then so on and so forth. So the same margin call operation works exactly the same, except it works in reverse. So whenever the synthetic becomes volatile, margin calls happen to make sure that there's enough collateral to, to defend the peg. Got you. So, so with that, talking about volatility in terms of price from the synthetic, what are the price oracles that you guys plug into um, for, uh, for Mir, for, for some of the synthetic assets that are mapping over Apple or Tesla or, or things like that? So currently we're working with Band Protocol, which is a uh, fellow Cosmos SDK Oracle project. Okay, got you. That that makes sense. Is there so? Uh, is the price oracle for Band is that updated on a real time basis, or is there some sort of uh, normalization that you guys need to do? Um, you know, based upon any lag that might be in the data that you're receiving for Band. Yeah. So uh, there's some. Uh, so the updates from band itself comes on a 15 second cadence, uh, but the way that it's voted in the chain is there's a time weighted average price. Mm. Okay, interesting. What, how does that, does that affect anything? Is there like anything in there that if, you know, uh, Jane Doe was looking to say like, okay, I like this, I wanna get involved in Mirror, that there's something through that time weighted uh, average that you're receiving, that like there's a risk in there that they should know before they look to, um, you know, sort of jump in the pool. Yeah, so great question. So if the Oracle prices were reading in the spot price of the synthetics themselves, there would be lots of risk like front running and manipulation. But the Oracle only reads in the uh, underlying price. So it, it reads in the price of Apple from NASDAQ. So unless there's significant risk that the price of Apple could be uh, manipulated for let's say like a full minute on on the main exchange. I, I don't think that's a realistic worry. It's, okay. Apple is very hard to manipulate. No, no, it's totally it's totally true, and it'll be interesting to see. I guess in one of those like weird flash crashes where I don't remember how many years ago this was, where you know Procter and Gamble was just tanking. Um, there's those very rare long tail events which. Hopefully, by the time that happens, uh, you know, this the protocol will be long since advanced and have taken certain um, additional patches, whether it be technical or or, or whatnot. So, in the in the vein, uh, keeping in the risk topic. So, one of the things that I that I noticed, or that was just mentioned, whenever I looked at some other research reports, was fear of reprisals. Um, you know, for some regulatory bodies, just given you know, these are synthetic assets, but they are mapping securities that are regulated by the SEC or whatever commodities exchange. Um, just just talk about that. I know that you're decentralized and, and everything, like the, the protocol is governed by uh, the community, but just talk about that and some of the considerations um, that you guys had to take, um, you know, into account before you stood up Mir and launched it into the world. Sure. So, I mean, I, I get asked this a lot in, in almost every, you know, the podcast or interview actually, but like genuinely, if you look at the way that mirror is operating, like there's, uh, so um, basically uh, in order to make changes to uh, the mirror protocol, or if you want to add new types of assets or remove some assets, everything is decided by governance. There's a community pool that's about $120 million strong at this point whereby uh, you know, a quorum of MIR token uh, holders get to decide where the funds are spent. But what, what we did when we launched Mirror is that we gave away all the Mirror governance tokens to everyone but us. 
So I I have no mirror tokens except the thirty thousand that I bought, you know, uh, in the open market. Uh, but like in reality, I get no financial upside if mirror does well. I have no control over how the mirror governance is being spent. And in fact, there's like a bunch of assets that are being whitelisted that I you know publicly spoke out out, out against. But it's like doing it's it's still going ahead anyway. So like even if I wanted to shut this down, there's genuinely nothing that I can do about it. I get no upside from this doing well. So like I think regulators would have a very hard time trying to hold me liable just for writing code. Right. At least give me money if you're gonna if you're gonna invite me, right? (laughs) No, for sure. I mean in terms of like making it hard for the protocol to, to thrive. So mere protocol, because I, I obviously like what it's doing. I think it adds a value to the world and also to this new financial system that we're sort of cropping up, um, you know, in real time. So not necessarily for you. I, I have no doubt that you'll be just, that you'd be just fine. Um, but in terms of like making it difficult for the protocol to sort of reach its full potential is what I was kind of alluding to. Ooh, actually, so like the interesting thing is, um, if you if you look at how mirror is constructed it's essentially similar to a contract with this which is you know like a cft in 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 sort of the lingo of traditional finance so uh cft is pretty much the same it's just a peer-to-peer agreement on where they think that the price direction of this particular asset is going to move there's usually some collateral that's put up to make the contract whole and then that's how sort of people speculate on price movements and and hedge their positions in different ways so what's kind of really interesting is that CFDs are legal in three main jurisdictions, which is the US, China, and Brazil. <clears throat> in almost all other jurisdictions, it's pretty kosher. So uh, in the UK, it's actually a really heavily used instrument uh, to gain access to markets when they're closed. Uh, and then in Asia, it's also very frequently used. In Japan and Korea, for instance, CFDs are very widely used and not even taxed. So um, generally, when the U.S. Uh, when when the SEC has tried to shut stuff like this down, like Abra, for instance, they've uh, tried to claim a tenuous uh, connection of jurisdiction, uh, you know, by saying that oh, these guys employ U.S. persons, or this is in, real- in reality a U.S. company, or this company has sold to U.S. persons. But not only did I sell no mirrored assets, I have nothing to do with the United States. In fact, even if I got subpoenaed not sure why I would even have to show up unless there was Interpol, which is not possible. <laughs> now, now we've, now we've gone, we've strayed into this, to this world of involving Interpol and, and, and avoiding SEC subpoenas and all, and all this stuff, um, which is hilarious. Um, not for me, but, uh, cause I am a U.S. citizen. I live here, so I definitely would not want that. Um, but that makes that makes sense, and like sort of how you're talking through it and the logic, um, I think it would be it, it seems less likely now. So I appreciate um, some of that particular clarification. So you're talking about whenever you launched um, Mir, you just sort of kicked it out to the world. Um, I know there were some uh, incentive programs that were initiated. Was that done? Was that put into place by Terra, or was that something that was voted on um, via the governance token? after you guys had already, you know, kicked it out to the wild and turned it over to the community? Oh, so the initial incentive programs, uh, like distribution, so we, we had an airdrop to, let's say, uh, Uniswap token holders before, like, uh, end of November timestamp. We had uh, liquidity mining incentives that were put in place in the initial smart contracts. So those were all sort of set by us when we designed the initial distribution, as well as the community pool. Um, and uh, yeah, now now we don't really have any control. So are the so is liquidity mining over um, already? So so like the the amount that the amount of mirror that we're going to be distributed um, via that particular incentive is is that gone? No, it should persist for uh, a few years. Four okay. Years. Okay. Got you. Um, I believe. Yeah. So I, I think. I'm just going to badly paraphrase. So yeah, that, that makes sense from, from what I read. I was, I was trying to paraphrase the, uh, the information I I read in the white paper, but it wasn't, it wasn't worth it. Um, Okay. I find that really, really interesting. And you, you had mentioned metrics beforehand um, that have been impressive for Mir. Were you just talking general price action or were you talking something else? Uh, well, I mean, price action has been interesting, but I don't know if it's been like, you know, super crazy. But in terms of metrics, 
there's close to 300 million TDL locked up in Mirror after six weeks. Uh, there's about, I think about 15,000 people that are engaging with the web app uh, on a daily basis. Uh, you know, Mirror is already interchain. So Mirror assets are trading in Uniswap on uh, Ethereum, mm -hmm. uh, TerraSwap on Terra, uh, and PancakeSwap on Binance Smart Chain. It's, and it's going to come to uh, as many chains as we can sort of build bridges to uh, over, or, over the next few months. So uh, it's, it's going to be really interesting. It's going to be in, in a lot of censorship resistant state machines. And, uh, you know, like given the fact that the only way to buy these mirrored assets is through Terra USD, which is itself a very young stable coin. So sometimes you would have to pay very large premiums to get your hands on Terra USD. I, I think, you know, like early TVL and usership, user interest is uh, very, very, uh, very, very good. No, I would, I would totally agree. Is there, so the, the TVL that you have locked up in the protocol is, what is that? So what is that for? Is it for the, the, the collateral of the synthetic assets that it, that is backing or is it, is it something else? I'm just trying to get a gauge um, of, of what that's mapped to, but also the general stickiness as well as, as you know, um, TVL can be, uh, very fast moving in this particular space. Sure. So um, it's it's a function of the amount of M assets and uh, Terra USD that is locked up in liquidity pools um, for across all the different exchanges on on different chains. So that would sort of subsume the uh, amount of collateral that's locked up as well because M assets need collateral to be minted. Got you. Got you. Okay. That, that makes sense. All right. So it's a little bit stickier than just the general run of the mill uh, liquidity mining or, or yield farming or anything like that, which is, which is always the thing whenever you're looking at some of these high flyers that come in with very high top level numbers of TVL, but know that it's just going to sort of evaporate or greatly diminish um, the moment those inflated rewards, whether they're yield farming or liquidity mining sort of um, disappear. So that's very interesting um, to see as well or to hear as well, I should say. So the, the final piece is, is Anchor. And um, again, just sort of, you know, walk the, the listeners and viewers through, like, what is Anchor? Like, what is the pain point, the problem that you guys are, are looking to solve with it? Um, and then we'll just sort of, we'll just sort of walk forward from there. Sure. So, um, well, as you know, like we, we live in a really interesting time. So uh, while I was growing up, sort of the values that I was taught was, uh, you know, if, if you work hard, well, not necessarily for my parents, but, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, like, uh, but at school, like they, they, they would teach you the values of working hard and savings and stability and different things like that. Right. But we live in a really interesting world where uh, there's just so much money being printed that uh, putting your money in a savings account actually doesn't allow you to save any money, right? So in, in fact, putting your money in a savings account is almost suicide because every year the value of, that sa of those savings are going down and you're not getting enough yield to compensate for your opportunity cost. So it's sort of like this giant, uh, giant sort of state-driven scheme whereby essentially like the money that you keep in a bank account is only insured up to $200,000 in a private, institu private depository institution that the government refuses to collateralize. Uh, and they're not even giving you real yield for it. And there's no real you know, alternatives to be able to do this. So this is why DeFi gets interesting, right? Because technically you could keep USDC in places like Celsius, BlockFi, uh, and um, you know, actual decentralized protocols like Compound and Aave, and then earn a real yield on USDC or Tether, right? But uh, the problem here is that uh, for, for BlockFi and Celsius, it's, it's, it's hard to comment because, you know, it's not entirely clear how they're getting the yield that they're generating. Uh, but, you know, from most reports, it sounds like they deploy the capital in lots of different ways. They have a set of money managers, like similar to a bank, whereby they just receive the Bitcoin or receive the Tether, and then they deploy it to lots of use cases. But obviously, you know, uh, with sort of, these are risky assets, so there's a lot of risk attendant to that. With Compound and Aave, the problem is that the interest rates are super volatile because essentially like the yield is a byproduct of leverage markets. So when demand for leverage on Ethereum is super high, the yield on USDC is going to be relatively high. 
If it's not, it's going to be pretty low. Um, so that's that's pretty interesting. But in in for an everyday user, in order to sort of understand something as a savings account, you need stable yield. So when you're putting money in, you need to understand what you're going to be getting for the next five years. You can't be like, oh, you know, this is like new food coin that popped up. So today or this hour, the interest rate is 15%, but for the next three days, it's going to be zero. So I can't tell you how much money you're going to make, but it's going to be better than zero. So, you know, take my word for it kind of, oh, by the way, we're in this like new thing called a smart contract that you, you need to read up on or, you know, if you understand and, uh, you know, have fun staying poor. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's not going to work. So what, what, what we wanted to do with Anchor is that we wanted to build uh, a interest rate protocol that isn't correlated to either the federal funds rate. So that, that sort of thing that powers the uh, commercial savings account or the speculative interest on demand for leverage for Ethereum. And so basically what we've done is that we've tapped into the staking reward in proof of stake to power the interest rates on Anchor. So the reason why this is important is because, you know, over the next three to five years, most of the major protocols minus Bitcoin is going to transition to proof of stake, which means that there's going to be billions and billions of dollars in, uh, you know, you know, staking rewards that are being printed in proof of stake blockchains, but none of these things are actually being put to productive use. So obviously, you know, the staking reward is the greatest source of wealth across all of uh, proof of stake blockchains. But the, the, really, like the only way that it's being used for is to compensate people for providing network security. So Anchor, uh, when a user deposits stablecoin, a portion of these deposits are uh, used to acquire staking positions across multiple different blockchains. And then the staking rewards that accrue to these positions are conferred to the depositor in the form of a stable yield. So essentially, the Anchor rate is a diversified stream of uh, a portfolio, if you will, of staking cash flows coming in from the best of what proof of stake has to offer. And we think that this can form sort of a reference uh, interest rate in, in the world of blockchains in the future. Very interesting. Very interesting. Is there, how's going to be the initial sort of composition of the quote unquote portfolio? Is it just going to be some of the top one? Like you take the top tens because, you know, there's tons of POS tokens or, or blockchains that are out there, which, you know, there's going to be more and more cropping up each and every single day. So is it just sort of, a cookie cutter diversification. It's like, all right, we've got 10, we'll just do 10% right across the board, or are we gonna provide uh, more emphasis, more weight to some of these blockchains that have more, um, you know, more security, more holders behind it, or maybe just been around um, for longer? So um, for some of the chains, it, it, it uh, you, you know, like the bottleneck there is our technical under, uh, lack of technical understanding. So we need to be able to understand the system and understand how the staking rules work really well in order to feel comfortable building out an integration. But, but for some of these things, it's because the risk is too high. For example, for blockchains where the slashing risk can go up to 100%, then it, it becomes a little bit challenging to be able to do that integration. But for most, it's not a problem. So right now, <clears throat> You know, very early for lunch, we'll be uh, looking to integrate, like, let's say, the Cosmos blockchain, very easy through the IBC uh, connection. Uh, you know, one of the pair chains in, in Polkadot, so that there's going to be a staking derivative of the DOF token, uh, and then Solana. Um, you know, so that, that bridge is actually coming very, very soon, as well as a staking derivative on top of Ethereum uh, called Lido Finance, uh, of which we uh, joined as a member of the DAO and as an investor. <laughs> interesting i'm 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 really i'm really liking this idea in in all honesty so okay all right all right i i really i really like this actually so let's let's kind of like bring it all together so how do you foresee this interplay of these three things that you kind of have, have built through terra labs i know so anchor isn't isn't live yet am i am i correct with that right when yeah, it, when so, it, go ahead yeah so the, the way that i'm thinking about it is <clears throat> in in order for there to be like uh you know fully fledged finance platform like so what what are the main pillars of finance right so it's payments it's uh uh savings and it's investments right so the efforts of what we're doing with our payments companies are just the first uh, Anchor addresses 
the yield problem. And the third, uh, Mirror, allows you to invest into any type of asset class and to build different constructs on top of this that you can't do with, let's say, the real world assets. The ability to build leverage, to compose this into smart contract systems, which is uh, very, very exciting. So basically the way that I think about it is that all of these different products are actually not standalone products, if you will, but are just features that enrich uh, the, the usability of the Terra stablecoin. So uh, at Terraform Labs, which is our company, we tend to think about our stable coins as the only product and everything that we do at the firm as, as ways to enhance the utility and the, and the feature set uh, of the stable coins. I love it. It makes, it makes sense and I love whenever um, seemingly disparate parts within a, a greater construct or ecosystem find a way to be symbiotic um, for you know driving a greater purpose which in your particular case it's to enhance the utility but also the utilization of the luna stablecoin i i really i really really like it so with with anchor the interest rates is that going to be something to to maybe terra labs is like okay well we'll you know create our own lending product based upon the interest rates that we're pulling from anchor or is it something or do you have a, a another uh, visualization or idea in your mind uh, for some of the interest rates that are going to come out of that particular protocol or the interest rate that's going to come out of it, whether it's going to be the, the short end of the curve or are you guys going to do long, like the full long tail of it as well? Sure. So um, we're, we, we have a pretty strong FinTech focus. So we think that a good way to distribute uh, sort of, or to get people using the anchor rate, uh, is, is to package uh, the Anchor protocol into a uh, Stripe-like B2B SDK that a lot of fintech applications can hook up to. So imagine like Venmo, for instance, uh, integrating with the Anchor uh, SDK. So all the unused balances that you have in Venmo is now able to earn an interest. Or let's say our Chai payments app integrates with the Anchor SDK, then in that case, the balances that the users haven't used to shop things yet uh, now earn interest, which incentivizes them to top up even more money there, which likely results in higher engagement and higher retention. Um, yeah, so this is sort of like something that allows a lot of fintech companies to be power charged. There's a lot of SDKs and services that allow you to add saving uh, payments to your app in seven lines a quarter less, but there's nothing for savings. Got you. Got you. I, I, li I like that. And it's been a very interesting, but also a little bit of a hot part of the market as well uh, in terms of rewards and, and things like that, bringing in um, the incentives for whether it's just retail spenders or whether it's merchants um, as well. I, I really, I really, really find that fascinating. So before we, before we wrap up, you had mentioned something um, just in passing, I can't even remember what in context, but you just talked about like seeing how things would grow over the next three to five years. So you guys clearly seem like you're building things for the long term. You're, you know, unlike 2017, where you're saying, all right, I'll stand something up, it'll be just good enough. I'll, you know, kick something out and wall we'll get rich. And there's even a little bit of that behavior now. You guys are, you know, clear have a focus that I want to build something that has utility and value for people now, but also for the future as well. So with that being said, where do you see, I guess, your particular niche of DeFi that you guys are tackling um, over the next three to five years and how you potentially play into it or help um, create that future as well? Yeah, so... <clears throat> This is something that uh, I've been thinking about a lot. <coughs> so, so unlike 2017, there's a lot of uh, uh, teams that are building really innovative things in 2021. So, um, you know, mad props to all the builders out there. But I would say that for most of the protocols, there's a heavy emphasis in looking in inwards. So what that means is, you know, a lot of the solutions are designed for people that are already in uh, you know, comfortable with trading and earning in crypto cr cryptocurrencies. It doesn't try to address the real world problems felt by everyday users that don't really have the ability to understand these things. So if you look at your finance, right, it be, it's, it's very easy for people to, let's say, deploy into DeFi pools, but it assumes an understanding of what it's like to, uh, you know, use a lot of these different protocols. 
so basically, if, if everybody's looking inwards, you devolve to a situation where, you know, it's a zero sum game whereby crypto just becomes a thing where some people make money and then some people lose money. And that's honestly not that interesting, right? If we persist in the full understand me, right? So I get this, so I'm going to make money. You're stupid, so I'm going to take your money, right? Then in that case, that's, that's something that's actually not that pretty, you know? Like, is that, is that where we want to spend, you know, um, years and years uh, working products for? And for me, the answer was no. So the different thing that we do is that we try to take outwards. So we tried to think deeply about how can we use a blockchain technology to build a better savings for everyday users? How can we build a way to uh, sort of uh, include the, the billions and billions of people that have never had access uh, to uh, be able to invest in US equities to be able to do so without having to do KYC or to fight against uh, adverse local regulation? How do we get people to be involved in digital payments without having to be, you know, be, be sort of uh, uh, to be swarmed in like multiple day settlements and having to high really high, uh, pay, pay really high fees. Yeah, so, you know, I, I think this is sort of the harder path. It takes longer to build meaningful TVL and ticket sizes of $10, $20, and $50. But it's honestly so much more rewarding. I, I mean, I can't say enough about that. Uh, it's, and it's not bullshit either. I, I think it's genuinely... Um, amazing because i totally agree with you and i think that's one of the beautiful things uh at least for me which has attracted me originally and kept me excited to be in this particular space is the colloquial or the collegial atmosphere that you witness within blockchain or defi or, or whatever particular niche that you're playing in because it's not a zero-sum game yet like even in finance investing so like even crypto fund to fund I can call up another quant fund or fundamental fund and we can have a conversation about Luna or, you know, what we think Bitcoin's going to go do the, the next month. Whereas coming from traditional finance, if you try to do that, you're going to get laughed out or they'll be like, sure, sure, sure. Like you talk, you show your code, like you show, like you showed this and and, and really not look to reciprocate. So it's a very much a zero sum game. So I completely agree that it's way more refreshing, it's way more rewarding to continue to like build out that ethos. But also at the same exact time, um, I, I think longer term, it's gonna be really, really valuable to everything because I myself am very guilty of looking inward too because you're just inundated with the here and now, but you realize that there's this whole huge world out there um, that wants to play, that wants to take advantage of some of these unique things that are being built in this new burgeoning ecosystem, um, but just need someone to, to sort of lend a hand or say like, hey, you don't need to worry about all the back end stuff. Just plug in here and go about your business. So I, I think it's really admirable. I think it's really interesting. I was already um, quite bullish and intellectually curious on Luna, Anchor and Mirror and everything, but it's like doubly heightened. I can tell you probably the only last time that I got off a podcast and been this excited about um, a protocol uh, was whenever I talked to Chad Bradford uh, of ThorChain. So I really, I, I really, really enjoyed this. Um, if there's anything that you feel like, crap, I wish I would have mentioned that or that would have come up during this particular you know, conversation, the, the floor is yours. Uh, no, I, I, I think we did some good coverage today, but uh, yeah, thanks for having me. This was fun. Awesome. It is, it's my pleasure. Um, I can't wait to have you back on uh, later 2021 to see, you know, how you guys continue to move um, and sort of evolve from there. So until next time, everyone, I will see you on the next episode of Crypto Muay Thai Podcast.